Good afternoon. afternoon. Welcome to worship this afternoon uh, as we continue our midweek Lenten services. Uh, This Lent, as you may have seen, we're going through sections from the book of Ezekiel as we meditate on the suffering and death of our Savior. And this whole, the theme for the overall thing we're doing with Ezekiel, it's actually, if you look on the back page of your bulletin, is I have done as you commanded. That's been the theme of this whole Lent. And that phrase is in the section of Ezekiel we're going to look at tonight. And brothers and sisters, obviously the greatest fulfillment of that phrase is Jesus himself, who truly did as God the Father commanded and bore our sins for us. We now focus our hearts and our minds on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We'll follow the order of worship printed for you in your bulletin, and our opening hymn is hymn 839. May the Spirit of God richly bless your worship tonight. Please stand. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord be with you. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. 
forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our hymns of thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in our time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy, now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A responsive reading from Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one who in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger. And terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king. I'm Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Lord, keep us safe in the refuge of your anointed Son, so that when the nations rage against him, we are not terrified. You have begotten him from eternity and have seated him on your throne in heaven. Let us see him as he truly is, the one who lives and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the Passion History of our Lord, according to Luke. Then seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together 
and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. This is the Passion History of our Lord. We'll join together to sing hymn 526. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, when my little nephews and nieces come and stay at our house, uh, one of the favorite games that I play to try and occupy their time as long as possible is called Find the Gnomes. This is a game that I have invented for them. And what I do, well, first off, at my house, we have an inordinately large amount of stuffed gnomes. I won't comment as to why, but we have a lot of them. So what I do is I take my nephews and nieces, 
and I put them in the guest bedroom and I close the door and then I go into the living room and the kitchen and the dining room and I hide gnomes everywhere, like anywhere I can find. And then I turn off the lights, I try and get it as dark as I can, and I bring them out and they just start finding all the gnomes. And it's a blast, it's great fun. Uh, they have a ton of fun, minimal amount of effort on my part, it's a win-win, I love it. But what invariably happens is the second we're done, they're like, Uncle Joshua, let's do it again. Uncle Joshua, let's do it. So we end up doing this like four or five times per session. And what I've noticed is by the third iteration, the third time through, I'll spend 10 minutes hiding these stupid gnomes, and they'll find them in 30 seconds. Because there's only so many places I can hide a stuffed animal in a living room. So the third time through, I'm running out. And they're just fine. It's just, woof, that was fast. You guys really found that fast. This is usually my cue that the game is over for now. And I know many of you, you guys know what this phenomenon feels like. Especially you parents. Like at Christmas. You spend weeks, sometimes months, buying those presents, wrapping them up, hiding them, then Christmas comes, kids come out, two minutes flat, whoosh, done. It's like, well, that was fast. There goes all that work. Dear friends, it's not a big deal. All it tells me is that I'm not very good at hiding stuffed animals in a living environment, and I'm pretty sure that that is not a life-saving skill, so whatever, I'm fine. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we've been going through sections of Ezekiel in this Lenten season for our, for our meditations, in the portion of Ezekiel we're going to look at tonight, something happens way too fast. Faster than it should. Tonight we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 9, and before I read it, I should warn you, this is not a well-known portion of Scripture, and it is fairly shocking. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Bring the guards of the city here, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a riding kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men and maidens, women and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing, and I was left alone, I fell face down, crying out, A sovereign Lord. Are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? He answered me, The sin of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say, The Lord has forsaken the land, the Lord does not see. So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring down on their heads what they have done. Then the man in linen with the writing kit at his side brought back word, saying, I have done as you commanded. This is the word of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, not to overstate the obvious, but in these verses it is clear that God is very angry like skull-splitting angry. And I should point out to you right at the start that this is a vision, okay? This is a vision. This isn't happening in real time. 
It's a vision that God is giving to Ezekiel, and it's about the impending destruction of the Babylonians, that they're coming to destroy Jerusalem. It's a vision. But as you guys saw, it is a brutally shocking vision. I mean, you heard what happened in it. You have six men. Or should, I should say you have seven men. Six of them are warriors with a weapon in their hand. The Hebrew word there means like a club, a weapon of brute force. Then the seventh man has on linen and he's got a writing kit. That's a scribe. And I should tell you right now that these seven men in the vision are angels. And you heard what the Lord told them to do. To the scribe angel, he says, go throughout the city, mark the foreheads of my people, the people who lament the sins here, the believers, the people who stay true to me. And then he says to the six men with the clubs, now go kill everybody else. God had had enough. He had had enough of the people of Jerusalem. He had had enough of them claiming, oh yeah, we're God's people, but then they would just embrace idolatry and sin. His patience was through. And he, he commands the angels, kill them, slaughter them out of my sight. You guys ever heard that old phrase? I'm sure many of us have. You see it in movies. I think it comes from the Middle Ages. That old phrase... Kill them all, let God sort them out. You heard this? What's interesting in that in our text, that's basically what God says, kill them all. I've already sorted them out. I know who my people are. They're safe. The rest of them, get them out of my sight. And brothers and sisters, if you look again at verse 7, it's a measure of how angry God is that he actually tells those six angels, defile my temple. Don't worry about the Levitical laws. The people have already defiled this place, so just start killing. Let the bodies pile up right here. I don't care. Get a move on. This is the speed which, which the Lord God wants this execution carried out. And dear friends in Christ, it's in the midst of this mayhem and carnage that something happens way too fast. Faster than it should. Remember that it's the scribe angel who is told to go throughout Jerusalem and mark the foreheads of God's people, the believers, the, the people who still have remained true to Yahweh, who are still waiting for his Messiah. And did you catch that by the end of our text, he's already done? He comes back and he's like, I've done as you commanded, it's over. Look at that in terms of the vision. Ezekiel is not even done talking to God yet. Those six angels who are supposed to kill the city, they're not even out of the temple courts. They haven't even made it out of the building, and the scribe has gone all throughout the whole city, and he's done. That's how few of God's people were left. That's how bad it had gotten. This happens way too fast. Ezekiel's not even done talking to God. And the scribe's back. I've done as you commanded. And brothers and sisters in Christ, this vision is brutal. It's shocking. And let's just come right out and say it. It's scary. It is frightening to see God this violently angry. Even if it's just a vision, it's frightening. It's also necessary. Every once in a while, the Lord God has to knock sinners upside the head and remind them that sin is a very serious matter. It has consequences. And in this vision, this is what God was doing through Ezekiel to the Jewish uh, exiles in Babylon. He was knocking them upside the head. Because they were in Babylon, Babylon, but Jerusalem was still standing. So they were all thinking, oh, it's fine. God kind of got angry. He took some of us, but this will be fine. We'll be back there before you know it. This is all the angrier God's going to get. It'll be fine. Jerusalem will be standing. We'll be back in a few years. 
And in this vision, God had to tell them, it's not fine. I'm not just threatening to destroy Jerusalem. I'm actually destroying Jerusalem in real time. And brothers and sisters, he's doing the same thing to us tonight. He is very lovingly but very harshly knocking us upside the head and reminding us what sin is and its consequences. That sin is not a game to him. It is not a joke. He is not playing around. Brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is that our Lord God does not just threaten to destroy sinners. He actually destroys sinners in real time. And the problem with us is that we minimize this reality. I'm not saying we do it consciously. We are children of God, but this attitude still seeps into us where we minimize the reality of sin. Like, it's fine. God's loving. He's forgiving. I mean, my goodness, I've been doing this pet sin for 35 years. He hasn't done anything yet. He must be okay with it. What makes it even harder is that you and I live in a sinful culture. And one of their big things is to minimize sin. They present God as nothing more than this big grandpa, at best. At worst, our culture tries to push God out of the room entirely, as if he doesn't exist. So why worry about it? You do you. It'll be fine. And in these verses, God is reminding us, it's not fine. It's not going to work. The truth of the matter is that our sin makes God divinely and violently angry. And dear friends, in the vision, it is only the people with the mark on their forehead that are saved. They're spared from God's wrath. They're his children. They believe in him, and they are spared from the destruction of sin God is bringing on Jerusalem. So I think it's right now it's a good question to ask, what was the mark? What did it look like that the scribe angel was putting on the foreheads of the people? And if you look in the English, all it says is put a mark on their foreheads. In Hebrew, what it says is put a tav on their forehead. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And at this time, if you want to know what it looked like, how they wrote it, I'm not making this up. This is a tav. This is the letter that the scribe angel put on the people in this vision. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't want to overshoot this. Uh, Ezekiel 9 is not a direct prophecy of Jesus, because you've got to remember believers at this time, they didn't know yet that the Messiah would die on a cross killed by Romans. They didn't get that yet. It's not a direct prophecy of Jesus, but at the same time, Christians... This is a little big, too big of a coincidence to just dismiss. Like the Holy Spirit didn't know what he was doing here. This is the mark that was put on their foreheads that saved them from God's destruction. Brothers and sisters, you know that mark. You know it well. It's on your forehead. God put it there. In the waters of baptism, the triune God put his mark on you. He put that mark on you. You remember how our order of baptism goes? A pastor takes a baby, and before we baptize them, we say, receive the sign of the cross on the heart and on the head to mark you as a redeemed child of God. This is what God did to you in baptism. He put his mark on you. He said, this one is mine. This one belongs to me. And you know, dear friends, that that claim to ownership is not light. That the sign of the cross God has put on you is not just some random sign. It's reality. The reality of your Savior. It was on the cross that Jesus took all of our sinful filth and stacked it on himself 
and it died for it. And in the midst of our sins on the cross, that's when God the Father unleashed carnage on him. God vented his rage on Jesus, and Jesus took it all. In our place. See, in the vision, God's destruction against sin starts at the temple, but it keeps going throughout Jerusalem. Whereas on Good Friday, God's destruction of human sin started at the cross, and it ended at the cross. Jesus took it all. Because, what of, because of what your Savior has done for you, you are not only washed clean and perfect in God's eyes, covered in Jesus' blood, you have also been marked as God's own. Dear friends, the Lord our God does not just promise to save sinners. He actually saves sinners in real time. This is what he does. And I know that you and I, when we look at each other, we can't see the mark, the cross, the top. We can't see it on each other. But Satan can. The demons can. The entire invisible spiritual world that Scripture talks about, to it all, your loving God has put a mark of ownership on you, and he has made it clear, this one belongs to me. And he has no intention of sharing you. He bought you. So finally, brothers and sisters, you who have been marked, covered by your Savior's blood, who belong to your God, just like the people in the vision, saved from the destruction of sin by our loving God. And on the last day, when Jesus comes again, then we'll actually see it on each other. We'll, we'll see it. And on the last day, when Jesus takes us to be with him to eternal life and salvation, everything he promised us, I bet you we'll just suddenly go, well, that was fast. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>
Hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants, who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. For favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. And eternal Father, you alone make the decisions about life and death. We implore your mercy on Robert, whose departure from this life seems near at hand. As he passes through the valley of the shadow of death, comfort him with faith's assurance that you are with him, and he need not be afraid. Spare him extreme physical pain, and encourage him and his loved ones with the sure hope of the glory that you have prepared for him. We ask all these things in your name, O Savior, and we also join to pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Thank you. 
Good afternoon again. Sorry. Sorry, it's fine. Uh, the only announcement that I would like to highlight uh, this afternoon is that last night at the voters meeting, we called uh, Miss Lisa Chamberlain. So please keep her in your prayers as she deliberates. We called her for seventh grade next year at Living Hope Lutheran School. So please keep her in your prayers. Uh, and with that, may God richly bless your evening and your week.